Howdy. We got my man, Krishna. Is that all All it is? East Forest. East Forest. All right. Krishna. There's a lot of Krishnas out there in the world. They'd never find my work. That is true. <laughs> They're not going to search Spotify for Krishna. Yeah. I guess you could, but they wouldn't find you. They'd find a blue guy. Yeah. That's true. Mm-hmm. So you were on uh, the Aubrey Marcus podcast, and um, I had been introduced to your music before that, but I think this was right around the time uh, Music for Mushrooms had released. Is that correct? That was in May, Music for Mushrooms. It was released yeah. 2019. Yeah. and when Music you go- for Mushrooms, a soundtrack for the psychedelic practitioner. Yeah, the full it. title of yeah. that yeah, It's yeah. like a book. You got to have the, the subtitle yeah. in as well. Well, let me speak to that, actually, because... I was thinking that if I just called, I intentionally put the word mushroom in the title. I, you know, I thought I wanted it to be bold in that sense, but also quite accurate. But when you when you say something like that, it's a bit of a splashy way of saying, you know what I mean? It catches yeah. your ear. And that's why there is that semicolon and then more of a, a very detailed description, a soundtrack for the psychedelic practitioner. Because then it really spells out, but it's not a joke. It literally is for... A psychedelic practitioner, which could be an individual taking their own trip, or I, I made it initially it was inspired by these research into institu- institutions and what I found lacking in their playlists. And so I wanted to provide a solution. So you're speaking to like research institutions like Johns Hopkins when they're doing? Yeah, NYU, Imperial College. Uh, they've all released public playlists of the music they were, they were using in their studies. Oh, wow. And I found them pretty bad. <laughs> Imperial College might have been the best, but the John Hopkins one, it gets a lot of the press and I was just shocked at what they're using. And what's amazing is they're they're having incredible results, right? Yeah. We all remember the data, like 70 some percent, one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives that maintained several years later, yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking like, well, imagine if you're using even better music and not just better music, but like I had been developing music for this space for 10 years by doing it. And just literally our own lab of saying what works, what doesn't work. And we had something, but I had never shared it because it's scary to kind of put yourself out there. So I'd shared it without saying what it was or just shared pieces of it. And that's what some of my older albums are, as we talked about at dinner. But I'd never said, well, here's the whole thing. Start to finish. This is what it's for. And it's sort of almost like a digital shaman. And when I released it, 10 years after I started developing it, two days after I released it, uh, the the Oakland or Denver, which one was first? Oakland initiative of decriminalization happened, whichever was first. And then the do- first two weeks Denver, later, yeah, was and then, and then Oakland, yeah. two days later. Wow. And so everyone said, oh, you released this to, you know, I'm like, dude, I, I planned this a year ago and it's been in the works for 10 years. It's like, I had no <laughs> idea that this would all, of course, the wave happens when the wave happens. Yeah. And for, and you, that perfect timing, divine timing, no question. You you mentioned on Aubrey's podcast for those who haven't heard it that um, this was something that you would you had developed in large part already and that you had tuned in with mushrooms in the editing process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as I was saying, it. I mean, to back up, the entire project started by me guiding psilocybin ceremonies because a friend asked me to, and I had my very first record called The Education of the Individual Soul. He was got really, really into this record. This is in 2008 and nine, And so he, he, just, he just organized a circle and said, you're going to do this. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I mean, I'm excited, but I don't know what to do. So really, we were just going to like listen to that record, which is only 45 minutes. But I knew I needed to have more. So we're going to build out from that. Maybe I'll play live a little bit so we can make it longer. Well, how do I do that? I guess I could get some looping pedals. Um, and I'd, I'd been like going to other ceremonies to learn, like ayahuasca, Lakota sweat lodges, San Pedro, and just studying what are the old traditions of ceremony, mm-hmm. and then getting into what's what do we know now of modern sound healing, and how can I bring those elements in? Like how do we entrain the brain, and blah blah blah. Put it all together in this soup, and try to create something that I was just trying to think what will take someone through this this mushroom journey in a way that's positive and safe. And we just would try things. And then I would 
next time I he'd start he'd do another one, and then he'd and I'd try something different. He would always push me. He's like, "What are you going to do different this time?" Or, or he says, "Now I think it's time to get rid of the album." I remember we said that one year, and I was like, "Get rid of it." He's like, "You don't need it." I was like, uh, "Okay." So we just play the whole time, and I play the whole time, four Take or five, six hours. Off. Yeah, I and then it just it. kept growing and growing, and you just learn. Like, well, and it created a musical language out of this and for four or five years i was only doing that i was not performing live i wasn't even really selling my music my album was free still is by the way that album's still free on my website or i should say a gift some people choose to pay uh i even logged it in with the internet archive which is uh so it's in like the library of congress as a free work for all time you know, <laughs> that's incredible the yeah i was really <laughs> dedicated creative commons license the whole thing I still have the copyright, but it's a Creative Commons license, you know, so you can't commercialize it without permission, but otherwise mm. you're free to reproduce it. And anyway, um, so you fast forward all these years and it just kept developing. And we, we started to have a protocol that we created um, out of real life work with people with psilocybin. And I was just seeing the profound results. Um, I think they're echoed in these research studies that they're also finding in their own way. And mine were less scientific. They're more anecdotal, but nonetheless, you know, hundreds of people. And um, out of this came a very specific musical language that is East Forest. And uh, it included the field recordings. And I wrote a little op-ed that's in Flood Magazine about what's different in the Music for Mushrooms album and why I did it, but how I did it and why I think it's different than the other things out there, whether it's the extended length or the sound healing elements or the tension and release or there's lots of things we could get into musically. But the point is, uh, it was time to share it. And uh, I felt this message that it was time. And, and so I, we did a ceremony probably in 2018 and it was two days, so two different ceremonies. And, um, I took, I just recorded it and the ceremonies are improvised. I don't think of them as performances because I'm not there to entertain. I'm there to hopefully be a go-between between between something, the mushroom coming to them through music. And I, tried to just forget about, I wasn't saying this is going to be this new record. I was like, I record all of them. Some of them I forget about. I don't think they're that interesting, but they were effective. But as long as it comes from the heart, it's effective. But this one, I was listening to it. And I was like, this, I think this is interesting. And I ended up just taking most of it from both nights to get five hours um, because there's lots of things I don't record in the ceremony. I'm out in the room, like doing bowls and stuff. So mm-hmm. it didn't, it, I needed didn't all the up. sort of keyboard looping time. And I, I kept almost all of it to make this album. And instead of editing the songs down like I used to in the past, I didn't touch, I barely touched them. I mostly like mastered them. You know, EQ made it sound really good, ran it through analog equipment, had it mastered by an engineer. And and there it was, five hours, start to finish. And now you can even, I wasn't even sure you could release on Spotify an album of five hours. And I tried to find the answer and I couldn't really find the answer. It's like, I guess I'll just try. And it worked. <laughs> I like, this is works. awesome. And that's that's like uh, an, a symptom of the digital age that we can even do these things now. I didn't need a label. I didn't do any of this stuff. And I could physically distribute it to the world uh, for very little money. And when you put the name in a title, people will key in that, oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about doing something like that. And then maybe figure out this could be a tool for them. And, and, here, and here we, here, that's what happened for you. <laughs> no doubt. I yeah. certainly, certainly <laughs> want to unpack that. It is, uh, that particular album has been a part of three pretty massive journeys of mine. And uh, I, I definitely want to take a deep dive with you into those. I haven't spoken about it yet on this podcast. Well, I think you should. But, um, and I certainly <laughs> will. We will today. I just want to get more on your background. You know, we were talking mm-hmm. last night about music. You said you had played band in class. Talk about like your musical history getting into this. Did it happen with medicine? And when did your medicine start? Um, it did. It absolutely. Yeah. What propelled it in the first place was that I had had some experiences on mushrooms with music that were just, you know, blew my mind and I didn't understand them. Excuse me. And that's that was the fuel for trying to figure out reverse engineer something. 
Uh, I mean, the very first one was when I was 20, uh, no, 19. It was my first journey, period. And it was on mushrooms, and I had a lot. And thankfully, it was really positive. But I mean, when all the way, I didn't know what time was in myself. And and I grew up, you know, in you know the suburbs, white kid, pretty insulated. I had no elders or anyone telling me that there was anything more besides what you hear from basic religion. So having a felt experience of that really blew my mind and my heart open. But I didn't know what to do. I had no one to talk to about it. So I kind of was just stumbling through life, always reaching for that moment again and and trying to find it through mushrooms, which I didn't do too often because obviously I realized the power of them as well. And through that stumbling in my 20s, I, I had had some experiences with music that I hit these ineffable infinite moments, I think that so many people have had uh, on psychedelics where it locked in with the music and the music itself became the, the world I was in, in a sense, the actual room, the architecture of my experience. And I wanted to create music for me to use as a tool that maybe I could be there longer or more reliably. I was just fascinated by that. And so that's why I started even trying. It was for me to use as a tool. And that first record, The Education of Individual Soul, you know, of course, the way the universe would have it, lots of things were falling apart in my life. I think I was in my late 20s. I was in New York City, and I was trying to do all the things people do. I was trying to make it, be famous, all those things. So I had a band. It was like a pop band, indie pop, piano thing, which what, I was just pushing, pushing, pushing for many years, and it wasn't really ever happening. And all this was falling apart. The recession of 2008 with Bear Stearns, all that, everything was falling apart. So there was openings for change, and... I remember, and this is of course when the ayahuasca came into my life and I was starting to explore all these other things and meditation and really starting to wake up. And I started making music that was just for me. And I, had, I was like, I'm never going to sell this. There's no other reason that I'm, it's just for me for this little tool. And the very first song that came out was 10 Laws, which is my most popular song today, 10 years later. That was the first song. And I'd also been doing little field recordings for fun because I also got into backpacking at the time. I was getting re-obsessed with wilderness. As in New York City, I went all the way up to the Adirondacks and I was just getting so turned on by nature. And I was recording the sounds of crickets and water and all these, because I, if I brought that back and listened to the sound, it actually like contained something about the, the memory of that moment. Almost like the soul of, it was a power. It was like, wow, it acts not just like a photograph of a mountain. I was like, I feel like I'm there listening to the wind at that, you know, these spots of wilderness. And so, of course, I started just playing around. It's like, what if I toss this into these songs, you know? And I remember dropping in, because I record people too. So I had my friend talking about his 10 laws. He talked he talked for four hours about all sorts of things. And he's a whole interesting character in himself, V.C. Johnson. But he had this little 10 laws thing. I remember I dropped it in the song and the frogs from outside his house. And it was just like a revelation of like, this is cool. Like this, this is like really cool. And this is clicking, you know? And and I and then I just started doing more and I worked on it for like a year in my spare time and I was getting into it. And I had no rules other than I was chasing a feeling. There's I the only glue is a particular feeling in the music. Anyway, fast forward a year and um I got to the end and I said, okay, I kind of have like a little record here. I'm going to listen to it, but with mushrooms as a way of honoring the, the inspiration. I didn't have any, I mean, that was just, that was my thought. It was September 16th and, um, of 2008. And I took the mushrooms. I still didn't have much information about ceremony. Anything. I think I took about probably two and a half, three grams or something like that. I don't remember. I remember I went on a walk through Brooklyn Heights till I felt like it was kicking in. Felt it kicking in, came back, went in my room, I had the computer there with the headphones in my bed, press play, put the headphones on, lay down. It's only a 45 minute record. And I was now journeying and my life changed. Like completely. <laughs> and what happened was, which it was the most beautiful moment I've ever had in my life because the mushrooms allowed me to forget and literally, like my brain couldn't understand how I made it anymore. Even though I was so familiar with this, I've been mixing it, writing it. Now I was like, I don't, what is this? I don't remember that now. So that part turned off. And now it was just an experience, a journey. And it was like 
I was hearing all the field recordings of everywhere I'd been that last year. All the places I went, my parents were in there, all the, uh, the little children, the little girls I recorded that were in this labyrinth when I went on a gig. It was just my last year of, my, of me searching for this new thing. And it's in the music. And then the music was this connected thing that was taking me through this you know, realm of synchronicity and emotion. And it was so beautiful because it was like my, my soul had tricked my ego into making this tool to use just in this moment so that I could transcend into a new sense of self. And I remember when it ended, I took off the headphones and I stood up and the whole room was like the matrix where it just like starts flexing. And I, would, <laughs> yeah. and I said like, wow, or something. And it would be echo. Wow, wow, wow. And I, I remember just feeling like it was like I... It was like a new being walked into me. It was like mm -hmm. there was before that and there was after that. And I didn't care after that if anything, that was, that was it. I was done. I, that was obviously the purpose of this whole year. And it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever experienced. I was good. And that's why I was just like, this is free. Anyone can have it. I don't care. Do what you want. Because how could I ever try to commercialize this thing that was so sacred and beautiful? So I started giving it to friends and stuff. and And... I did a journey with my uh, girlfriend at the time, thinking like, well, I think this record is specific to me because it has my mom and all this stuff. And so, but maybe, you know, let's give it a try. A little ceremony, a little candle. She lies on the couch, puts the headphones on, and she does it. And she takes off the headphones. She's like, oh my God, like I saw my dead father. And like, we worked through this trauma of, you know, all this stuff. And it was like super healing. I'm like, wow, okay, that's interesting. And then now a few days later, my roommate, try with him couch the whole thing but the headphones it's like on. sasha shogun with the inner circle experiments <laughs> on himself gives it to his wife yeah. and then the close friend none of us though were in those circles though. yeah you know we were curious but we were just we were not for psychedelic people at that point or anything and anyway he had a profound experience and then fast forward to when i went to my first ayahuasca ceremony and i met this guy who became a very close friend of mine I gave him the album. He got obsessed with the album and he was the one who started organizing the circles. Mm. I wouldn't have done it without him. Um, and he became a big, big uh, proponent and helped me kind of take off. And so that, that's where it all started and that's why it started. And uh, it was definitely guided and it was definitely for um, very small, humble reasons in the beginning. And I think about five years ago, I felt a message to take it out of those private shadows and more into the public light. And that's when I started performing publicly more. And I had to figure out how to do that because you can't just drop into a bar, which I was playing at <laughs> fucking bars, okay? Like, I mean, it was tough. Piano bar, New York One City. of the worst gigs I had was in LA. And I remember I was by myself in this shitty bar and a guy was so drunk and he was standing right in front of me with his back to me, like talking to his friend about, he, like not even listening while you're playing and there's only like seven people there yeah it was super disrespectful and i'm playing east forest music but trying to like be a little of this and a little of that not knowing what to do yet and still always working with that but feeling more in my lane now like look just do this and people will do what they need to do but really had to struggle to find um a voice and a way to bring it into the world and navigate this this sort of capitalistic, alcohol-fueled public, mostly public. That's how a lot of gigs are. Yeah. And it's, it's been an amazing ride. It still is. Um, but as more people like Aubrey, you know, get tuned into it, you start to get invited to do things that are going to be a little more like set up for success. Yeah. <laughs> people are maybe on the same frequency. Yeah. They, that frequency they're is they're not there alcohol. for a better reason. <laughs> and it's a little more conscious. And it's like, well, now we can go deeper. And, and of course, as we said, the times are changing. So now there's this huge public wave of consciousness around s intentional therapeutic psychedelic use. Yeah. And Talk about it, your experience when you, when you started working with some of the different medicines and gathering information from their lineages and how song and, you know, ikros and drumming and these things were, were incorporated in. Because one of the things I noticed in the, at a certain point in the Music for Mushrooms album was, you played Native American flute so beautifully that I, mm. I thought I immediately thought of Parangi, and I was like, "Well, it's this... an easy instrument to play." So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it, yeah, you, it's hard to play a wrong note. Um, but thank you for that. I a lot of the one thing that ties all indigenous ceremony together that I've found is music. 
So that is a core element. So that alone is interesting. And then within that, you'll often find elements of rhythm as being sort of a core element, whether it's drumming or a rattle. And then sometimes there's there's melody and song, like Icaros, um, and there's other f- formats of that as well. And so this is interesting that you, you notice this. And for some of them with the Icaros, it's believed that that is actually the mechanism of the ceremony. Okay, it's not, this is what's calling forth the spirits and it's absolutely critical to doing the ceremony. You can't do it without it, at least from that Peruvian tradition. So... I noticed this and I was, so some of it was just picking up what they're doing musically and some of it was just some basic research. And I did, and because like, for instance, with the Lakota Sweat Lodge, it's, they've intentionally very been very strict about, you don't change anything. So I know that's how they did it a thousand years ago. Mm. And they probably thought this shit through. So it's like, okay, so why are they doing this and what are they not doing? And, and also the elements of ritual and ceremony. This is also something I wanted to pay attention to. You know, how are they doing this? Because we know from modern science that the set and the setting is going to have a profound effect on your experience. So some of this is placebo and psychological, and some of this is alchemy and spirit, things that we can't quantify. And, and some of this has to do with the way music it has the ability to transcend dimension, to transcend language, to engender emotion and feeling. It's this interesting math that exists in the whole universe, but the way we interpret tone and ratios, like a fifth is a fifth is a fifth across the universe. That's interesting. Uh, and music is, is something that's so ubiquitous in our lives. It's like asking a fish what water is. And I don't even think we full, I'm doing it with right now with my voice. I'm using tones and sound and rhythm and pitch to communicate ideas that are just that. They're ideas representing other feelings and things that, and then we can agree to it with my mouth noises and gestures. <laughs> but it's, it's a form of sound. I mean, it really is, that's what it is, a sound. And the way sound, it's encoded into our uh, ancient histories, like God spoke or the Big Bang, sound. And that is creation. It's almost telling us that in this ability to create sound and music in our words, our thoughts in a sense, uh, we are creating and the power of that. And we hear this a lot these days from modern teachers and you hear it in, from old teachers. Um, and music, I feel, is sort of the next iteration of that where it's beyond even words and we're just speaking and feeling, which is like so awesome. And any of us, no matter, you could have a PhD in musicology or you could be sitting next to the person who actually is a little mentally challenged and knows nothing about music, but you're both gonna emotionally respond to a certain chord change in an equally uh, familiar intensity. Like it's, it's, it just does that. Why? <laughs> you know, like, why does it move us? Why is it? And it's so, right now on this planet, there's more music than has ever been ever. And it's only growing with Spotify and Apple and the way it's playing everywhere. And then we like to play it. And like, everyone likes all these different kinds. We've got death metal to ambient music to country music. I mean, the diversity of how it's all, the source is, expresses itself through creative form, I think music is undervalued even though it's overvalued. We don't appreciate fully what it can do. So in a ceremony, uh, mushrooms don't have the same uh, tradition like say ayahuasca has. Ayahuasca exists amazingly inside the can- container of a ceremony almost exclusively. It's not used recreationally for, for all intents and purpose. And inside that, you've got the Akaros or maybe you've got uh, UDV or whatever, it's still music and song, it's still a very tight container. The opposite is true with mushrooms. It's almost exclusively been used recreationally. Many people have stumbled into deep spirituality with it, but 95% of people that I talked to before a ceremony, have you used mushrooms before? Either be no or yes, I was with my friends in the woods or I was at a party or I was at a concert, all those things. It might be positive, it might be negative. Almost never did I hear from someone, yep, and I, I've sat in ceremony with it, meaning I basically gave it stillness and space to do its thing. And most people didn't realize the full potential of what can come from the teachings of psilocybin and then once they do give it that space and silence they're like i it was like i was on ayahuasca or this or that uh, they're, they're shocked at how deep it can go 
Yeah, it blows people away. Terrence McKenna, I was listening to, uh, you're familiar with the podcast, The Psychedelic Salon with Lorenzo yeah, Haggerty? Yeah, Lorenzo. Yes, yeah, so Lor- awesome. Lorenzo's great. He had um, one of his many, many McKenna lectures. Um, Terrence gives the lecture, and then at the end they do a Q&A, and somebody asks him, is there a wrong way to do psychedelics? And he says, yes, if you don't take enough. <laughs> yeah, <he's> beware <laughs> the underdose. Yeah, and everybody yeah. started laughing. He goes, I'm serious. In the psychedelic 60s, everybody had one mushroom cap, a couple hits of a joint, a little bit of wine, and there's 30,000 people at Golden Gate Park, and it's, that's one way to experience it. But you never mm-hmm. know the true medicine that lies within it without creating space for it in the way you would ritualistically like you do with ayahuasca. Well, I, I'm a big fan of Terrence McKenna, but I actually disagree with his um, like five-gram thing. And that's a meme I hear repeated back all the time when I'm out there in the world. I feel it's a little bit dangerous personally because uh, I think the key there is the space and the silence that you can cultivate. Uh, In stillness is when spirit speaks to us. And stillness, or even silence, and I'll I'll speak about this tonight in the concert, that silence, uh, Gordon Hempton is a field recording artist, described it not as the absence of sound, but the absence of noise. And I like that description because it's not that it's literally, there's no sound. It's just that the noise is, so when we move noise out of our lives, and that can be more than just white noise that we audibly hear. It's the noise of our brains, the noise of our activity, the noise of our thoughts. Clearing away the noise, now clearing away the fog, you can hear what's already there. We're not placing an idea into you. We're peeling back the onion so you can hear. And I love that idea because... It's, it's just about giving space. So, you you know, some people, I've seen it, one gram is another person's five grams. No so, doubt. You know, yeah, or, or for you, well. you know, five grams <laughs> is yours is 25. But <laughs> the point is that uh, it's. I think it's not appropriate to say this, this is the threshold of like, now you're really doing the work. And everyone has different ways of doing it. I know what Terrence is saying, and he's right, that if you're kind of dawdling around, it can actually kind of strengthen the ego but you can't attach a number to that and say, this is where you cross it's, the threshold. Which is true. And if you do take smaller amounts and you give it the proper space, you're still going to hear stuff and yourself in a sense of yeah. source and your truth. So there, and there's no, there's no limit as you found, like <laughs> it just goes this way and goes the other way. It's like, I, it just, there's no right or wrong. It's like, there's just more and less. And, yeah. And sometimes people take it and nothing happens. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why. I think the only people that I've known, um, that have had non-reactive experiences to psilocybin were people on SSRIs. Yes, and there is a genetic component I've read about that it is possible you're just not that susceptible to that chemical. Mm. But um, the average person, it's a pretty amazing compound as far as effectiveness. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's obviously there's, you know, Graham Hancock talks about that seat at the table idea. And I think of all my favorite teachers that all have a seat at the table and it's hard to, it, it's, it would be egoic for me to quantify and say which one's best or which one is sitting at the, the head of the table. It's the circular yeah. table, right? But the beautiful thing, one of the beautiful things about psilocybin is that it might be the most scalable from a micro level to a macro level. And and all that play in between can offer so many lessons, so much teaching. Yeah, it's it's deep. I mean, I think Terrence was the one who put it uh, right behind DMT and LSD after it as far as uh, uh, potency. Yeah, or power. Yeah. 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 Absolutely incredible. Let's, you've, you've discussed uh, a critical piece here, and this is definitely something I wanted to get in with you today was how silence and stillness matter so much in preparation and in, in the space itself. What are some of the other protocols that you, you mentioned protocol when you're talking about learning from these other great teachers and the other plants, what were some of the protocols that you guys implemented as you were designing the music and over the years? Well, I think stillness, spaciousness, silence is the kryptonite, in a sense, to our modern life. Uh, and in some ways, it is the answer we're looking for. It's not about us an additive approach of more, it's less. And in that, we're returning to that which already is. So I think with people's preparation for any journey, I was learning from what works. There's a very strong dieta or preparation for ayahuasca typically, and that's probably the strongest one I know. And that was a pretty good model 
because a lot of it, even though there weren't the same physical constraints, they're still pretty good to follow. And so we often tell people three to seven days. I mean, it really starts from the moment you decide to go. I would find that there was like a, you've, you've, you've lit a fuse of, of sorts and it's always in my mind. Oh yeah. in two months like that thing's coming and this action now or choice I'm making, it's connected. I just no free ride. I know I'll have to face it. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> I'm going to make another choice in this moment. And so it becomes a walking meditation, a walking path. Uh, once you, in my mind, or that's at its best, it does. Because then it's really, truly holistic. You're seeing, and that's great because then afterwards, it's the same way. It's about integration. It's how does uh, everything I experienced in that journey, how is that now reverberating into my life? And medicine works across time. It's not like you get a free pass afterwards. It's like, well, it's actually, you know, crosses from bef- future into past to present. Um, so we, we, we do this stuff about diet and just trying to be mindful of kind of cleaning out your system. And there's different ways and different approaches to do that. And then cleaning out your mind with having a meditation practice because that's sort of the anchor and the keel of the ship during the experience. Uh, so having a familiarity with that as long as possible before, if not many years, would be great. But even if it's a few weeks, that's better than nothing. And um, the day of avoiding stimulants like that are going to kick you one way or the other. We talk obviously about medications and that's something that's too specific to talk about in the yeah. podcast and avoiding like screen time, just all things to kind of bring you back down to center. So you feel when you walk in, you're very grounded and calm and confident and, and hopefully in a good place is the ideal way to walk into the experience. Um, and then having some support in it and before it and afterwards, I think it's great too. So you're not just kind of rolling in getting the stuff and then diving back into your life. You want to have some time to integrate and to let it settle and um, have someone to, or some people to process with some accountability. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Integration. Mm-hmm. That's one that's, uh, you know, as I was mentioning to you about the, the impetus for the dose that I had was this man, Kalindi Ayi, and seeing him through all of his, pros and cons seeing that he looked fairly grounded he looked in his body you know Mm -hmm. and and that when i haven't seen that before in ayahuasca circles or even in just everyday life it's um it doesn't matter necessarily what you get in the medicine if you don't take that and embody it right like you're not going to draw that back in you know yeah and and you see that you see people who just keep diving in i feel like it's actually they get into this megalomaniac type situation where they're not grandiose ideas and you know it's a tool and it can be abused for sure that's my opinion and i've seen it and i fell into a little bit of conflict myself because i didn't just want to be doing circles where i felt like i was playing for the same people it's like i think there's tons of value for playing for well people who want to be more well and at the same time i wanted to reach more people and that's one of the impetuses to make the music for mushrooms record because like well then i don't i don't have to even be there It's just, I'm just playing a role. You know, it's one, it's a big role in music, but this could open it up to millions of people in the world, simultaneously people versus just one small ceremony at a time. And in my heart, I don't think there's a difference that I don't think it's better that I'm working with someone who's more important or that it's more people. Because at the end of the day, we all graduate and the single mother uh, caring for her de- her her mother who's sick and no one knows about it. That is just as important honorable work in the universe and the scheme of energy as me working with um, Tim Cook of Apple or Donald Trump or something. I know yeah. that sounds, that doesn't make logical sense, but in my heart, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, the small work is the work. There's no It's all work. the work. Paul Selig said that yesterday where he, he told this story about the guy Brent walking through life saying... Why am I here? Why am I here? Why yeah. am I here? Mm-hmm. And he pulls up and there's a giant tree branch that fell in the middle of the road. So he stops his car, he gets out, he moves the tree branch out of the way and he gets back in his car and drives off. Why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? <laughs> well, the lesson is the lesson of the day. The medicine is whatever's right in front of you. And if that's taking care of your sick mom or running a country. Well, uh, the American malaise is that we always have to be famous and doing something more important. And it's, we, that's not an Eastern idea. 
So you don't see that. We want to be the machine. And I think many people in the East are fine being a cog in the machine. They would never think they're supposed to be the machine. And there's a sickness to that because, I mean, come on, we live in a country now at the peak of it where our president is literally famous for being a reality star. He's basically doing nothing. And we have, we have people we worship like the Kardashians who did nothing, but we worship them for some reason. <laughs> There's something glamour about them. And it's a strange time of uh, honoring the least important, not just honoring it, but propping it up and dreaming it into existence. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky space. So talk a bit about, um, you know, each of these things obviously layer together. You, you talked about that, that pre- mushroom experience with the with the first album and then the post and who you are now Mm -hmm. how has your life changed in terms of what you do on a daily basis like daily practices of meditation breath work stillness how how have you grown in that arena Mm -hmm. because i think those are the tools that seamlessly go hand in hand and again if you never take mushrooms those all those tools are available to you right now Mm -hmm. but they seem to help they seem to help us integrate better if we have those practices in play yeah, I think practice is there just for that. It's sort of the recognize that we're riding a wave uh, and you're going to fall off and get back on. So it's you're never at some destination. You're always surfing. You're always, that's what life is. And that's what the Buddha taught in permanence. So we, we holding on to anything is the suffering, which is a challenging lesson because by our nature, we hold on to life. And I think the ultimate motivation is our recognition that we're going to die. And that inexorable fate is a problem. <laughs> uh, and so that's sort of, for me, that's what's going on every day. And I, I think if it is for everyone, they're just maybe, how awake are they about it? Um, I think Monday Night Football or shooting heroin, they're all different forms of escape. That's not bad, I'm not judging it. But there's nothing else to do. There's only one game in town once you realize what the game is. And that's returning with God in the sense of, fulfilling what you already are in a sense of dissolving into it, which is, I, I'm, my heart tells me is death, uh, which is a boundary condition I can't see beyond. But we're obviously not meant to, otherwise the jig would be up. Yeah, what kind of game would that be worth? There would be no game. Yeah. If you were just here to be blissed and knew everything, well then it'd just be a, it'd be a soul vacation, but there wouldn't, were he, I've heard that, ideas like coming to earth or i should say this whole universe this dualistic binary universe is one of the harder incarnations but one of the faster which in itself is confusing to me like well time's irrelevant what does it matter if but it's sort of something about like you you the work is thicker you know but it's it's the brave souls and there's other forms of universes that you can do work in that are completely different we can't imagine them but not as intense as earth (laughs) <laughs> earth is a bit earth is like kind of a place you go to really dive in deep and go quick yeah uh, that's like even if that's fifty thousand lifetimes but you know it reminds me of um well each lifetime is like that sure right? doesn't feel like it right now but, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time it does you know? yeah that reminds me yeah. of uh alan watts the dream you know when he talks about that imagine that you if you had the power over your dreams and you went to sleep each night you could dream a dream of a life where you would experience all your joys you'd fulfill everything in life and all your wildest wishes would come true. Mm. And then the next time you went to dream, you'd say, well, that one was so easy. Let me add in an obstacle or a surprise here. And you'd go on, so on and so forth, all the way down the road until this dream happened. Yeah, right, right. I, it's so goddamn confusing. It's like, that's why I have to stop. Some, the path for me is, is through creativity or feeling or the micro moments of just nothingness of peace. I think peace is... Uh, the most potent word in a way, almost more than love, because it's like love's inside peace and that equanimity of per- perfection, which is, uh, that's sort of what I'm seeking. That's why I started doing that music is because I touched it at times and I just wanted to be there all the time. And that's when I say return to God. I think that's what I mean. It's the same thing. Um, it's encoded in our sense of faith you see it in religions. There's different ways they talk about it. I I would love to say I'm more spiritual in my practice or disciplined. I'm a very disciplined person, but I'm also like, there's so much more I could be doing. 
I'm a pretty modern person, like with an iPhone and I have all the problems that anybody else has and I struggle. And I, in some ways I see that struggle as the fuel to allow me to then do what I do. Like I make the music so I feel better. I guess if I felt better, maybe I wouldn't make the music. And then the whole thing would be like, <laughs> all right, you're done. But I, I have a lot of problems. I really struggle. I mean, I was at the Ram Dass retreat last week there to perform, really fulfilling like a dream. And I was having a hard time. Like the first, I had to perform on Saturday. I got there Wednesday. And up until I had to perform, I was a fucking mess. Like anxious, irritable, angry, um, which is not how I'm supposed to, quote unquote, supposed to be there. Everyone's all blissed out. And I'm like, I don't feel blissed. I feel like a mess. And Fuck like, that guy. Why are you so happy? Y- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I even said that when I was like, well, everyone's <laughs> telling me they're having, they're on cloud nine. I'm not, why not? I'm supposed to be. And I was just nervous and I was just like anxious about playing and the pressure and all sorts of other things. And you know, it's a head trip. And I go on those trips and then I work through it and I go on a different cycle of the wave, just like a sound wave up and down. And right now I'm on the other side of that right now and I'm feeling really pretty centered. And but that was that was last week, you know? So <laughs> I have to realize then the cycles will continue. And within those cycles, there's larger cycles. And within those cycles, there's larger cycles. And it goes the other direction. There's smaller cycles and this infinite wave of experience. And then why am I holding on to any of them? they're just states of being. And and I think what meditation and psychedelic experiences can teach you is the sense of self beyond those experiences, the sense of self beyond the thought. Who is the thought? Who are the thoughts talking to? Okay. I often find myself like having a conversation. You know, you should blank. I'm like, you? Who are these two people? You know? <laughs> like, I, and I think these things are are interesting and, um, but just like anybody, I, you know, my practices are music and creativity is the biggest one. I know that's like the way for me to keep my head on straight. And that's a discipline. Like if I'm not playing, I feel like I'm not expressing a certain energy. And if I don't do that, it feels like I've put a plug in the stop and then things start to get really rough. Everything else starts to be like, I get depressed and, and things like that. And I've dealt with some really serious depression in my life. And unfortunately that's been a fuel to search but it's no fun yeah i wouldn't wish it on anyone and it's something i've been dealing with since i was like in first grade that's that's just the path i'm on i i would like to tell you that i i hope to get to a point where it's all won't happen and maybe that'll happen i think it's better but uh i find life to be challenging yeah beautiful immensely beautiful I'm immensely grateful and I find it to be uh, a beautiful, challenging dance. Yeah, no doubt about it, brother. And boy, am I, you know, fortunate. Uh, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, man. I just try. We're all given gifts. And I think uh, the, the message in the journey is to do the most with them. And again, there's there's no judgment on the public level of those gifts, right? Um, and it's, but it's, but doing your best to to maximize this incarnation, I feel like is the work and figure, and you just figure out what that is and then you go do the work. And the yeah. rest, you know, you're not attached to the fruits, just the labor. And uh, I just interviewed Peter Crone and it put a lot of things in perspective, but um, I asked him about his practices and he said, just be in the world. Everything is your teacher where you're in resistance or acceptance. Yeah, there's nothing else. Yeah. It's like join a get team, out of the cave and pick up, <laughs> exactly. And and do life. Um yeah, sometimes I think we think that it's something extraordinary. We're waiting for the extraordinary. And actually, like God is in the mundane and and the moments of true peace and enlightenment is happens to us all the time. We just let it pass by it's a micro moment there's these slight moments of like you see a look in someone's eye it's in the midst of having to go to the bathroom and these other things going on but there it was there it is i should say it's always there it's no further away than your next breath uh and and that's a gift you don't have to go to the ashram for 20 years you don't even have to take a psychedelic i mean i'll show it to you loud and clear perhaps and then it's like maybe that'll help you remember we, we, a lot of us including me we need some strong medicines these days but 
we're all quite hungry. And that's why you're seeing this explosion of the wellness movement and, and yoga and psychedelics right now coming back. That's why. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yin and yang to the other side of it, which is the technological revolution, the inundation of information, the overload we're experiencing, the toxins we're experiencing, the political upheaval, the topsoil crisis, the water crisis, uh, the, the climate change crisis, the uh, go on and on and on. Those are all each individual real crises. All of it symptomatic and mirrored in the personal spiritual emergency that's happening as well. And uh, we're in the birth canal. There's no more going backwards. We're in it. And everyone has choices to make about their role to play in it and what they want to do. But the, the, the answers we're going to have will come from the inside out, not from the top down, from other people fixing this or some new invention. All that may or may happen, but all come from people having their own inner insight and making individual choices. And everyone has their choices to make and they're equally important. And everyone graduates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to say that the suffering we experience isn't real. It does sound like a paradox because it is. Um, but that's sort of what we've been taught in from spiritual lessons, like a Buddhist koan. That's what they're trying to tell us is it's, it's beyond, it's beyond logic and thought. It breaks the cogs of the machine. That's the point of the koan. So you can boop, poof, all of a sudden feel it. Yeah. It's almost like getting kicked back into that observer state where you witness I'm not my body. It's like being kicked thoughts. in the balls and there's a moment of like, everything stops. <laughs> <laughs> and you're focused on one thing. <laughs> yeah, That's great, brother. What about your experience? I mean, you told me a little bit about, and I was encouraging you to uh, share it because it's like, I mean, how about on this level? You were using the Music for Mushrooms album three times. And I was curious, like each time you used it, if being familiar with it was actually a negative or you don't even know what the fuck is happening. Like, it's like, it's helping you, but you're so in a different place. It's just more of an anchor there. So it doesn't matter if you've heard it before. Yeah, I was curious about that too, specifically with mushrooms. Because the first time I used it, it was with a, a troublesome experience with LSD that I mentioned on Aubrey's podcast with uh, all the all four coaches from Fit for Service. Yeah, you said you had like um, a milligram, which is like... a potentially a thousand micrograms like way 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 more and that that to uh i mean i don't think there there's such a thing as accident but i thought that it had leaked out from the pressure of the airplane it yeah in fact it had dehydrated and was concentrated right so i added and, water <laughs> it fucking put me uh and you went on a hike yeah in public definitely not the right set and setting uh no guidance and and even though i consider myself well versed i certainly wouldn't consider myself a, a high level curandero of the medicine or any of that stuff um so it was it was yeah it was the roughest experience i'd ever had and, and as i had mentioned like i've never considered in guiding others or working with myself 911 is a real option <laughs> and i thought like we're going to get fucking medevaced off this mountain yeah with IVs. if it helps you were like let's do it i know that horrible spot yeah. whatever it takes yeah i just didn't want my friend to die who was yeah. turning inside out yeah man and I, I mean i've i've purged hard with ayahuasca i've i've seen people turn inside out and needed activated charcoal but it still wasn't at the the rate in which my close friend was purging and we had a finite amount of water and um you know, something I was mentioning to you, the big download from that was I knew I had had enough medicine to tap in either to my higher knowing or to the the great spirit of all, the God of all, everything source, and, and to get like real downloads. And I was receiving zero back. Like usually when I ask questions, I don't hear a voice. I don't, I don't see words. I just automatically know with a capital K, there's a knowing. Right. And there was zero of that. And uh, it was only until we had friends locate us, move us aside to the shade and laid down and we threw on your album. It was the first time I had heard it. And uh, I just took a couple deep breaths and I looked up at the clouds and, and then everything shifted. And all of a sudden <laughs> the wave of downloads started crashing in. Thank God. And uh, yeah, thank God for sure. And God was in everything. Praise God. My uh, my buddy, he just goes, it was the... It was funny how how synchronous, you know, like if you when you do ayahuasca, you realize like that you can have shared visions and sometimes those take place simultaneously. And so um 
he was like, there's eyeballs everywhere. And right as he was saying that, I was just witnessing God in all things. And I was like, fuck yeah, man. That's, that's what I came here for. Not in this way. Not, not in, right. It wasn't the how I wanted to get here, but this is where I wanted to go. And uh, it ended up being a beautiful experience, one that I never wish to recreate, you know, but um, just, just what I needed. And also the realization that subconsciously or maybe from a soul level, I am calling in the ceremony that I haven't given myself. And so the microdose on the mountains turns into that when I'm unacknowledging the message, the message to go in and drop in a little deeper. Right. So we had uh, a few days after that was the first time we properly listened to your um, music for Mushrooms album. Hopefully uh, a better I, sound system than a way, iPhone. Way better yeah. sound system, <laughs> um, you know, with, you know, a full written intention and smudging and all the practices that, that Aubrey and I have gleaned from the different medicines. And that was one of the most beautiful and grounding experiences I've ever had, which is what I needed. I needed to be grounded mm -hmm. post that much LSD. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I'm trying to factor in when frequency, that's always something that's kind of troubled me because I like listening in stillness to when the next one is rather than planning it out with like a, a a hedonic calendar like to talk about in Stealing Fire. I think that takes the fun <laughs> out of it because then am I just dropping in because this is the due date or am I dropping well, in because I'm actually... I find I never drop in unless I make a date because I can always find an excuse not to. That's yeah, true. I'm the opposite. Some well, people are... I, I totally hear what you're saying. Yeah. But, uh, well, to your point, it's funny because I've always scoffed at the hedonic calendar, but yeah. now I see a purpose because I'm never going to wing that dose of yeah. the 30 gram mushrooms. Yeah. yeah right. And so <laughs> it's now that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now I know. And um, this was carefully planned too, though. But I had a, I had a friend send me a video of Kalindi Ai. <laughs> and uh, I'll link to it in the show notes for people to watch a YouTube video. And so she sends me this and she's like, Have you ever heard of people taking this many mushrooms? And right on the front, it says purposely. <laughs> yeah. 20 to 30 gram mushroom. Like, I'm, even Stamets, his first time, he took an ounce, but he just didn't know any better. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And never went back that far again. So Kalindi's been doing this for 20, 30 years. He's speaking on stage at one of the largest psychedelic conferences. And even though I'd had written, the guy's got to be a moron to take that much. You know, I, I watched him and I was like, This is actually giving me permission. Mm. And I've had downloads from ayahuasca and mushrooms themselves to scale up 7, 10, 14. And the reason for that was I wanted to work at a similar level to the depth I was receiving with ayahuasca, but to have that access stateside because I haven't had great practitioners, you know, blue belts, purple belts, guiding the medicine with ayahuasca is a tricky thing, yes. you know? So I make my trip to the Amazon or to Costa Rica at Sultara and then, uh, you know, stateside, let the mushrooms be my medicine. And, um, you know, in any circumstance where it goes to be ceremony night, there's usually others in the room that I want to offer some care for. And not that I'm a black belt, but just to have an extra hand at the steering wheel, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And um, to be of service for others. So I've never given myself space for that. And um, this was planned and I, and I don't recommend it. Uh, in the intro of this, I'm sure I've already given because we did the intros after a very sharp disclaimer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I ground up 30 grams of mushrooms. I believe the strain was Kosamui, which is a lot like Thai Cubensis, is very loving. But at that dose, again, kind of that. It is those, what it is. Yeah, yeah, those things go out the window. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had fasted all day, took them in the evening at 8.30 p.m. And in the beginning, I had, I had a list of intentions that I had written out. And uh, it was for sure the most beautiful experience I had ever had in the beginning. I had died for the first time. You know, our son is four and a half and he's very much four and a half and he's my son for sure like he very much goes against the grain and butt heads with us and you know at times he's an asshole and as kids are they're feeling out their their boundaries and they're seeing what they can get away with and i often think of him as this kid who and i was just talking to gabby reese about this like our fear is not the stage that they're in our fear is they become that as an adult right because we've all seen adults who are assholes so not wanting that to be the case, like that's where you get wrapped up in how do you parent? How do I connect? All those things. And um, it's been hard. It's been hard for my, both my wife and I. And, uh, you know, now she's she's uh, pregnant again and we're very fortunate to have that. But those are things that I think about with him. And, and so one of the visions I had of him was witnessing his soul for the first time. And it was like an ancient language that I saw, but I recognized that it as him in this golden white light. And I could see all the knowing and wisdom that his soul carried. And I just... Whew. 
I was floored because I had been looking at him as this little kid who has all the traits of a little kid, all the laughter, all the joy, all the anger, all the, you know, I don't love you, dad, like all that too, you know, but I'm seeing him as that, not as this great teacher that he is for me and for my wife, right? Mm -hmm. So to witness that was so much beauty and um, yeah, really, really special and really important. And of course, I'm asking about the sex of the child that's to be and all these things. And uh, of course, we know now through modern medicine, but, you know, I wanted to know things like that. And uh, I was getting a lot of downloads. Like, you don't want to know. It's better to be surprised. And like, that was cool. Like that, how special it is that we don't have everything figured out, right? That we don't know what the game is that we're playing, right? Mm -hmm. Not with 100% certainty, because then there is no game, you know? And so... um, all this experience in God, all this experience in the love and the joy and the bliss. And then it slowly starts to reverse. I have this mandala on my wall and I see this, this dark like caterpillar coming out on me. And, and I don't want to get too far into the weird stuff because for people who haven't done psychedelics, like it's, it's trip reports can get out there. But I was seeing beings in the room with my eyes open for the first time. I've never had that experience on DMT, not 5-MeO, not ayahuasca, Never experienced that. I've had relatives come to guide and to be in my space, but it was usually one at a time. It wasn't like insectoid beings there working on my body. There you go. So I knew I had hit that level Kalindi talks about. You're there. I'm there. Okay. And uh, he talks about, you know, Pandora's box. You can open Pandora's box and visit this dimension of hell, which is personal. And, you know, I just finished the DMT dialogues. And one of the the common things they talk about, Graham, Graham Hancock talks about in his chapter as well, is that when you see darkness, whether that shows up as Satan or a demon or anything that's scary to you, and it offers you to go somewhere, you say yes. Or what can you show me? What can you teach me? If you push that thing away, it usually ends. You come back to your body and you're like, damn it, I should have said yes. So as this worm crawls up my body, I look into it and I'm like, oh shit, that's the darkness. And I ask, can I go there? And the answer is, yeah, I can go there. And then immediately go into at least five stages that I recall of my own personal hell. And these were the gnarliest fucking experiences. And they each one felt eternal. You know, and it started with like, you shouldn't have taken this much. Now you're fucking dead and you're going to be here for eternity. And everyone I know looking at me like, you fucking idiot. We told you not to do this. Even my wife saying like, you just had to push, didn't you? You know, so all this blame and guilt and these negative emotions that live in me somewhere, you know, like that's what Kalindi's, I mean, that is as above, so below. If the universe is and beyond is fractal and holographic, then all is within, right? There's that Rumi quote, you're not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. And I fucking felt that fully, you know, but each layer of hell was so personal and just, um, it was revealing. You know, it was so revealing for me to come out of that and understand all of these corners live within me. Some of them were fucking super obvious. So I had your music on, right? And uh, at a point I was like, fuck this, I got to fucking turn it off because <laughs> it was, I was just, I felt like there, it was like a conspiracy to get me to take the 30 grams to get me to get to this point to end consciousness. Oh, it was my fault. No, I, <laughs> okay. I was like, so sure. I, I pull the fucking speaker out of the wall, I turn it off, I lay back in bed and you would start singing. You would start singing. And with I'd the be, music off. With the music off. And yeah. I'd go, oh, how nice. And then it would stop. And I'd hear like a refrigerator buzzing by my ear. And I'd be like, I fucking hate that sound. And I'd turn and a flashlight would go in my face. And you're like, fucking light. And I'd move. And then I'd get a knife in my back, like right where I have back pain or had back pain. Oh, shit. And so it was like this self-driven motor of all the ways I microdose hell on a daily basis, in everyday life, it was showing me every minute thing that I have resistance to. And, and consciously, I would try to surrender. Consciously, I would try to accept. But it was one until I literally gave up and just said, who the fuck cares? Like, to feel that energetically, and then I'd get to another layer. But um, hell was by far one of the best things that I've ever experienced in medicine because it was the most revealing thing and the hardest thing. 
And um, I thought I was dead when I came back to my body. I even laughed for a second and looked at my hand and I was like, that's so funny. My consciousness can't picture me without a body. And I took a cold shower and um, I looked at this photo of my son and I witnessed the same light going through that energetic signature of his soul and just was blown away. And then it reminded me of the whole experience. So I was like, oh, wait, that part happened because I was so fixated on hell. I realized like, maybe I'm not dead. And I looked at my phone and it was fucking 12.01 a.m. It was three and a half hours lift off the touchdown. I've never had experiences go that quickly either. So I imagine the fasting and the prep that I had done that day was a part of it. But rebirth was the last thing I wrote in my intentions. And it was like, I mean, I've never experienced anything like that. You know, I've been, I've been taught and shown I'm not my body in ayahuasca reframed my belief about myself, reframed my belief in reincarnation, or given me the belief in reincarnation, shown me everything is conscious. Everything is God. All is of or nothing is. Animism is true. It's all fucking animated by the same thing. It's all source. I've gotten all those downloads, but I've never felt like I got to a point where I was gone and I'm not coming back. So to come back then was like, wow. And I looked at my hand and it looked like Captain Marvel. Like blues and golds and i just felt like neo in the matrix like holy shit what do i want to do now so beautiful <laughs> how do i want to live you neo know in the matrix that's what i felt like when i stood up it's like the matrix <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. i was like oh wow this is a new new thing i'm walking into mm -hmm. yeah you're talking about the hell realms and and what'd you say it's like uh that the teachings only came through that or the suffering or something about uh that all that lives within me. Some of that was painfully obvious. Like one of the hell realms was my wife, uh, me talking about everybody about this pregnancy and then her having a miscarriage. And like, I witnessed the miscarriage as just this explosion of blood and she blames me for it. You know, like that repeated for infinity. And so that's a very obvious fear. I don't want that. My head of mantra, we are safe, we are safe, calling that in. And is what's funny about the mantras, because I had a friend ask me that, and it's like, if the mantra is something I believe, that's a cool reminder. But it doesn't need to, I don't need to remind myself of that if it's already known, right? If I am calling that in, then there means that some part of me doesn't believe we are safe. And it was shown and exposing all of the ways I don't fully trust in this experience. Anywhere that I have attachment to outcome and anywhere that... Um, I have resistance to something as small as the refrigerator sound. Yeah, the teachings come through the suffering in our lives. And that goes back to what we're talking about, the struggle that we face in our lives, that, that the grist for the mill is the point in a way. And without it, there's unfortunately no point. Yeah, that's <laughs> the beauty of polarity. Aubrey talked about that, uh, witnessing the devil for the first time and seeing that, that choice to hold that polarity so we could experience this life. It's impossible to have good without bad. It's impossible to have up without down. It's impossible to have all spectrums of the polarity without polarity itself, which allows us to have this experience. Yeah, that's the playing field of this of, of this universe is, is just that. Those are the rules of the game. Yeah. Yep, everything's on off. Everything's uh, one or a zero whether you're asleep or awake or birth and death, breath in, breath out. It's, it's the language of life. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that story. It's uh, profound. It's, and I'm, I mean, I'm happy that the, maybe the music was a small tether in it, but uh, nonetheless, it's just there to hold a hand uh, through all of these experiences. It was perfect. I felt felt you definitely felt your presence in the room until you needed to and unplug then, it out of the wall. Because and then you was, were still there. It didn't maybe matter. that's causing everything. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. That's not it. I mean, at that point, I just for, I forgotten that I said yes. You know, because uh, I didn't write that down. I just forgot how I got there. Like, why the fuck did that happen? Is this just a guaranteed when you take mm -hmm. that much? Mm -hmm. But then, uh, you know, I didn't sleep that night. I just started writing stuff and, and it all came back and I remembered the whole trip and I realized like, oh yeah, there was a point where I said yes to that. So you're, you wouldn't repeat that experience, but you're glad you did it. 
that was my experience initially. And uh, now, you know, after watching more Kalindi. And- oh, boy. <laughs> this is your problem. YouTube, that's who you can blame. <laughs> There's an invitation there. And I think uh, not for everyone, you know, it's 100% clear, not for everyone. But the invitation for me is, you know, one where Kalindi talks about the world needs real life. Dr. Stephen Strange is in it. And the purpose of that is to, to become comfortable enough in those places. And I'll stop on that just to say, it's not just exploration. That's for sure something that they mentioned the DMT dialogues as a way to see if there are external intelligences and potentially intelligences like we experienced in ayahuasca that may have, um, I don't even, not even sure of the way to word this, but a consciousness that sits outside far enough that they can see and help, right? Anybody who sees outside of your purview can see into your life and say, hey, you know, I noticed this thing about you. And you're, if you're receptive to it, you can take advice, right? You can take the criticism and say, you know what? You're right. I have been doing that. But if you're closed off to it, and you're like, fuck you, man. You got your own shit. You know, but but maybe these external consciousness can give us pointers and help. And again, all that is in within as well, right? So if tuning into that can be the answer too. But um, the real reason I want to do it again is because I think of hell as my report card, as I go through the school of life and I ask to see the report card, whatever fear shows up will show me right now where I'm at. So if I'm there again in three months or six months <laughs> and I think I'm doing great mm. in life, it's going to reveal everything at that dose to me. Well, I mean... Fear that I'm unconscious of, fear that I'm conscious of, and where, where can I be in full acceptance and full love and full trust with? What's the hurry? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I see a warrior soul who is a brave soul and you want to slay those demons and it's like, slay away. I support you. And if you choose not to, it's like, that's just as okay too. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have the utmost gratitude and it's not like my cup isn't full. It's fucking beaming full. This is the best I've felt in a very, very long time. The most centered and grounded I felt in a very, very long time. And, uh, Everything makes sense right now, even though that's a funny thing to say. You know, enjoy that space. (laughs) There still is the mystery, you know, and there mm -hmm. still will be curveballs. That's guaranteed without question. I'm not Mm -hmm. trying to say, like, I got it figured out. I don't have anything figured out, but I'm okay with it. Well, you're surfing the wave right now, and you got a nice tube. It's like, continue to surf. Yeah, brother. And then see what's next. There will be more waves. No doubt. Mm -hmm. No doubt, brother. Well, so excited to be able to sit with you tonight. Yeah. And uh, listen to your music live. And I'm so excited that you're here with Fit for Service. And uh, you're just a beautiful soul, brother. And you've ah. helped me so much in just this very short time that I've been working with your medicine. And uh, you yourself are medicine. I love you, brother. Thanks. Well, well, ditto. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. So thanks for your chat. Where can people find you? You have a podcast, obviously your yeah. music. You know, it's funny. You mentioned Lorenzo. He was, I think, one of the first guests i had on my podcast that's awesome <laughs> i love that guy um yeah there's east forest podcast that's easy to find um and then obviously eastforest.org that has all the things to all the different things whether it's retreats or live dates or all my music but you can find it wherever you listen to music spotify apple uh, instagram east forest it's all pretty easy to find i try to make different ways for different people to walk through based on what is the right doorway for them for some people, it's the music, a lot of people. For some people, it's a live thing or a retreat. Maybe the podcast is more about words and talking and ideas. And I'm continuing to explore that, like the different mechanisms to for people to dive inside. Amazing, brother. Thank yeah. you so much for all your work. Yeah, thank you.